Hi, and welcome to the University of Wisconsin Center for Financial, Financial, Center for Financial Security's webinar about uh, financial education. Is it really all about cognitive functioning? Uh, today's webinar is the third webinar in a series of webinars that the Center for Financial Security has been uh, conducting this year in an effort to help share the research that's uh, been conducted and also with a specific uh, intention to not just share the research but really talk about the practical application of the research. So today we have two presentations. We're first going to hear from Pam Hurd, who's going to share the research that she's conducted about um, the link between early life cognition and schooling experiences and late life financial literacy. So Pam's going to share that the result, re, results of her research and also talk about the implication of the, those findings so that vulnerable populations who maybe have more limited cognitive functioning can manage the increasingly complex financial world. So we're going to hear from Pam first, and you all should be able to see Pam on your uh, screens. And then we have Jean Hogarth, who's going to serve as a discussant and really uh, give us kind of the practitioner view and some of the, the implications for practitioners um, uh, from that research. So the way that I'm going to give just a few housekeeping remarks and then we'll get right into the webinar. So just to give you a sense of the agenda for today, we're going to, after my brief remarks, we're going to turn to Pam for her presentation and she'll talk for about 20 minutes and uh, then uh, her presentation will be followed by Jean's uh, remarks. And we're going to ask that we hold questions till the end, but what I'd like you to do is feel free to go ahead and email questions as you have them. So you can email questions in real time while the presentations are going on. If you look at your, your, your screen, uh, the screen where the title slide is, is now showing, there's four icons above that screen, and the second one is a little one that looks kind of like a balloon. Or uh, that's the one that you would type. You would double click on that to get a screen where you can type in a question. So I'd encourage you to, you know, as the presentations are going on, go ahead and feel free to type in your questions, and we will get to as many of those questions as we can. Um, just to let you know, you are muted, so really uh, typing in questions is the only way to share your comments or questions. So please take advantage of that. Um, I will also let you know that if there is anyone on the line that has technology questions, we do have a help desk that you can you can contact, and the number to access the help desk is 800-442-4614. Again, that help number for the help desk is 1-800-442-4614. And then lastly, I'll just say that this call is going to be archived, so if you do want to access any of this information in the future, you'll be able to access the uh, webinar along with the uh, paper on the Center for Financial Security website. So with that, let me just give a brief introduction of Pam, and then we will turn to her for her presentation. But Pamela Hurd is an Associate Professor of Public Affairs and Sociology and also a faculty affiliate of the Institute for Research on Poverty. She's an expert on social welfare policies, including Social Security, Medicare, and long-term care policies, and she became the co-director of the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study in 2010. She's the author of numerous articles and chapters that have appeared in Social Forces, Gender and Society, The Gerontologist, Journal of Aging and Social Policy, and The Blackwell Companion to Sociology. She's a Ph.D. in Sociology from, the Syracuse, from, <laughs> from Syracuse University. And with that, we're going to turn to Pam. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to talk today essentially about the relationship between early life schooling and early life cognitive functioning um, and late life financial literacy skills. So basically I'm focusing on older adults here and how these things are associated with older adults' ability to effectively manage their financial resources in retirement. I should say here that this research is, part, is supported in part by the Social Security Administration, uh, but the opinions and findings expressed here are, are solely those of the author, not those of the Social Security Administration. Okay, so I just want to motivate why I think that this is actually important to talk about, especially for older people. Um, and part of the reason why I think this is an important topic is because things have changed pretty dramatically for older people in terms of their income sources in, in late life and the complexity of retirement income. So if I think about my, my grandmother, for example, um, her retirement income was relatively straightforward. She had Social Security, 
And then she also had um, a defined benefit plan, which would have actually been my grandfather's from when he was employed, and then a little bit of private savings. Um, so essentially what that would look like is every month my grandmother would get a couple of checks in the mail, and then she would have to effectively manage um, that kind of monthly income. But it's, you know, it was relatively straightforward. But when you consider what my mom's experiences like are, are like in retirement, it's, it's really quite different. So she still gets that Social Security check every month, or more likely a direct deposit. But what she also has to manage is much more complicated than what my grandmother had to manage. So she has to comp manage uh, multiple pension plans from multiple employers. And these are defined contribution plans. So her employer wasn't managing them, she was. She was investing the money on a monthly basis. She was figuring out where that money should go. And in retirement, she also has to continue to manage that money. So she has this mixture of different defined, or defined um, contribution plans from different employers. And then she has a mixture of private savings plans, like individual retirement accounts, which she's also trying to manage. So what that looks like is she's basically on the computer every morning trying to manage those accounts. Now, for those of you who are familiar with annuities, some might say, well, she could just take all of that money and invest it in an annuity, and an annuity would make it relatively straightforward. It would return to that model of she'd be getting stable monthly checks. But the reality is, for a lot of very complicated reasons, or a range of different reasons, that very few older people end up taking all of that to find contribution money, private pension plans, um, and investing those in an annuity. Uh, approximately somewhat, we expect less than 10% of people. So what it looks like is this really complicated array of things that my mom has to manage, um, especially relatively when you look at what my grandmother was managing. So, um, you know, wh why, why focus on early life schooling, though? Why focus on cognitive skills in terms of trying to understand um, how effectively my, my mom is able to manage all of those things? Well, as I started to look at the literature and the research, there's a lot of research on sort of short-term interventions, on classes or um, even webinars like this or printed materials, and how that might facilitate people's financial literacy skills. But we know a lot less about how early life schooling and early life cognitive skills may ultimately affect those same things, those same financial literacy skills in late life. And there's a lot of reasons to believe why these things should matter. Um, so, for example, the research does really show these strong relationships between educational attainment, how much schooling you have and these kind of outcomes. But we haven't looked much more closely at those early life schooling experiences. So that's what I wanted to do and sort of see how much do these things really matter. So just to be sure we're all on the same page, um, what do I mean by financial literacy? So what I broadly mean by financial literacy is how it's defined or was defined by the President's Advisory Council on Financial Literacy. So it's the ability to use knowledge and skills to manage financial resources effectively for a lifetime of financial well-being. And again, I'm especially focusing on those in late life um, for, for this particular project. To give you a sense about how people kind of actually measure um, financial literacy, there's kind of two ways in which um, existing research tends to think about it. So you can think about um, knowledge-based measures. So you, you give people this list of questions and you ask them about their ability to calculate compound interest, um, their ability to tell you the difference between a stock and a bond. Alternatively, people employ um, behavior-based measures. So these get at what people actually do. You know, what do their debt levels look like? Are they participating in, in retirement plans? Um, these measures are both have their advantages and their disadvantages. The disadvantages with the knowledge-based measures is this tells you about what people know, this tells you what people know, but it, it's not really telling you what people are doing, right? So we all know that we're supposed to eat healthy and exercise, but a lot of people don't do that. And we might think that that, that might be similar when we're talking about financial literacy skills, that it, not everyone is going to effectively use those skills. Alternatively, behavior-based measures absolutely capture behavior, but sometimes it doesn't really capture people's actual ability to do these things. So for example, um, maybe someone has a lot of debt levels, but there may be things outside of their control that contributed to those debt levels, such as um, catastrophic medical events or health events. 
So I'm going to look at a slightly different measure. And what I want to look at, in essence, is people's knowledge of their own individual financial resources. Do people know how much they have in their checking accounts? Do people know how much they have in their pension plans? These are really sort of basic questions, but things that I would argue it's, it's sort of difficult or it's going to be difficult for people to effectively manage their financial resources if they don't have an intricate knowledge of what their financial resources are. Now, I do want to emphasize this sort of thinking about financial literacy in this way is probably most applicable for older people. So I'll give you an example, a private or a pension plan, for example. It's less, probably less important than I know precisely or even approximately what's in my what's in my pension plans right now in my defund contribution plans um, because I have another 30 years to go what's most important is that I just keep putting money into those plans and and having some sense that that I'm doing that uh, on a somewhat reasonable way uh, contrastingly for someone who is in their say mid mid to late 60s it's pretty important that they that they have a good assessment about where their resources stand because like my mom for example if she doesn't have a clear sense about what her resources actually are it's going to be very difficult for her to make choices about how much to spend uh, and about where to maybe move those resources around as the economic environment changes so just stepping back again, my broad research question here is how do early life cognition and things like high school coursework, and I'm going to focus especially on math classes, correlate with knowledge of individual financial resources in late life? So just briefly here to give you a sense about who, who I'm talking about here, that this data is based on a study called the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. This is a study of one in three Wisconsin high school graduates from the class of 1957. So we have basically 30% of all people who graduated from Wisconsin high schools in 1957. And we've been following, we've been tracking these people across their entire lives. And so we have a lot of information on these individuals when they were in high school, including IQ scores, including the kinds of course that they worked that they took in high school, a lot of kind of background information. So I'm using those measures, but then I'm, then I'm using, um, when we spoke with them again in 2004, we asked them a series of questions about um, their assets, what their retirement plans were, how much they had in checking account, so on and so forth. And I'm using those measures from 2004 to get a sense of what I think their um, financial literacy skills look like. So to be clear here in 2004, I'm looking at individuals who are approximately in their mid-60s. Um, and to get a little bit more specific about these outcome measures that I'm looking at, um, I have one measure that looks at the ability of people to answer um, all of the asset questions that we ask them. So we ask them approximately 14 different questions about varying kinds of assets that they have. And in essence, I look at the proportion of those questions that they were able to tell me basically what those assets were, how much they were, basically. The second and the third get a little bit more specific. So for individuals who had um, an IRA, a 401k, any kind of defined contribution plan, which was actually a majority of the people in our study, um, how many, what percentage of people could actually tell me the value of those pensions, the, the overall value of those pen pensions? And then finally, people's knowledge of actually just their checking account balance, the percentage of people who could tell me approximately how much was in their checking account. So I'm going to cheat here and give you an overall sense about what our findings look like. And I'm going to focus on cognition first. So first and foremost, we, we, I absolutely found that cognition matters, that these early life cognition measures are strongly associated with my late life financial literacy measures. Um, but what's interesting is that it really matters most or really only matters for people without college degrees. So approximately 70%, 60 to 70% of our sample did not have a college degree. The remaining approximately 30 to 40% of individuals had a college degree. It was for those people with only, without a, a college degree that this, these measures really had a strong relationship. And we may assume that college has some sort of protective effect. So but to just give you um, a closer glimpse at, at what this looks like. So what I'm looking at here is the percent of individuals knowing the value of their private pension plans. And I'm looking at this by IQ score. 
So I want to emphasize here that the people that I'm talking about, the comparisons I'm making, the only difference between those people are their IQ scores. So approximately these are people uh, similar gender, the same gender, um, same educational attainment, um, same marital status. What, the, the main difference here is their IQ scores from high school. So the average IQ score is 100. So I'm comparing people towards the bottom and towards the top. So people with an average IQ score of about 70, and this is the bottom 10 to 15th percentile in terms of IQs, about 63% of them were able to tell us the value of their private pension plans. This compared to about 81% of people with an IQ score of about 120. So there's a 17 percentage point difference here. This is a pretty big difference in terms of people's knowledge of their private pension plans. If I focus on um, knowledge of overall assets, so this is a percent of all the asset questions that they were able to answer. Those folks with an average IQ score of about 70, um, about, um, they were able to answer on average about 83% of those questions. Um, compared to over 95% of the questions for people with an average IQ score of about 120. And then the checking accounts. Um, so the differences were much smaller on this end, and this isn't that surprising because this is sort of a much um, simpler question, quite frankly, the value of your checking ac account compared to asking people about their overall assets or about uh, you know, a, an array of different private pension plans that they have. Um, and the differences here, actually, interestingly, were um, mo focused more between the mid and higher ends of cognitive functioning. And so basically, someone with an average IQ score of about 100, a little over 80% of those folks were able to tell us the values of their checking accounts um, compared to um, over about 87% of those with an IQ score of about 120. In terms of the math classes, so we, we actually tested a lot of different coursework variables. And the ones that had, the, had meaningful relationships, or at least somewhat meaningful relationships, were the kinds of math classes that people took. So we asked people, um, or we knew basically whether or not people had taken, um, for example, trigonometry or calculus courses. And we knew um, the average number of semesters of algebra that individuals had in high school. And so we made these measures appropriate for when these individuals were in high school to sort of figure out who was getting more complicated math curriculum. And basically, we did find some small um, but not very strong relationships between these math coursework measures and their financial literacy skills in late life. So again, I'm accounting to, to understand who I'm comparing here. What I'm comparing here is people who have similar IQ scores, similar levels of educational attain attainment, um, similar background characteristics like the educational attainment of their parents, the income levels of their parents. The only differences I was looking at was the kinds of math classes that they had taken. And so approximately you would see about five percentage point differences in terms of knowledge on a lot of these measures. So for example, the pension measure, the private pension measure, we saw that people who had taken trigonometry or calculus were 5% were more likely to know the value of their private pension savings accounts. So these um, uh, variables were not quite as strong as our cognitive functioning variables, that, but they were present, and they are interesting. To our knowledge, we know of no other research that has kind of looked, tried to look at, at coursework. And uh, it's sort of interesting. I, I was at a conference a few months ago and spoke with someone who does math education um, at Dartmouth College, and she was sort of stunned that we saw these relationships given um, in essence, how long of a gap we're looking at here. You know, we're looking at people's math coursework in high school. And so she was sort of amazed and intrigued by the fact that we saw some of the associ associations that we're seeing there. So it's interesting, but we're not, we're not sure exactly what to take from that at this point. So Gina's going to spend more time focusing on implications for policy and practice. Um, but I think the broader point that I still would like to make here is that policymakers and practitioners really need to take, um, really need to carefully consider the differential consequences associated with uh, more choice for older Americans. So what I mean by that is just simply that, you know, the financial lives of older people have gotten more and more complicated over time. 
And we need to understand that the capacity of people to manage that complexity varies. And what my study indicates is that the people's cognitive functioning does seem to play an important role in people's capacity to effectively manage those retirement resources in late life. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Pam. And as I mentioned before, uh, if you are interested in the full uh, PIMP's full paper, you can go to the Center for Financial Security's website and access that. Uh, but next, we're going to hear from Jean, who is going to share with us uh, her perspective uh, from the practitioner's point of view. So let me just give you some brief introductory remarks to Jean, and then we will turn it to her. But Jean Hogarth is the manager for the Consumer Education and Research Section of the Division of Consumer and Community Affairs at the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, prior to joining the board in 1995, uh, Jean had a previous experience including seven years of high school teaching, a year on the extension faculty at the University of Illinois, and 13 years on the consumer economics faculty at Cornell University. In her position at the Federal Reserve Board, Jean is responsible for research and outreach initiatives related to consumer financial services, and some of her recent projects include initiatives on consumers' use of banking services, consumer protection strategies, and consumer testing for comprehension and usability of disclosure notices. Uh, she's the author of numerous scholarly research articles as well as consumer education resources on financial management, and she holds a Ph.D. in family and consumer economics from The Ohio State University. So just one other reminder, as you're listening to Jean or if you're thinking back to Pam's presentations, if you do have questions, please just use that little chat bubble um, at the top of your screen, that little icon, and type in your questions, because we'll go to questions immediately following Jean's presentation. Great. Jean, take it away. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Karen. And I want to thank Pam for her very thoughtful paper and presentation. And I also want to thank um, Nicole and Rachel and the folks over at the uh, um, the Center in Wisconsin for organizing and facilitating this, this um, webinar. Um, and I also want to extend my welcome to those of you listening in. Um, they did share with us the registration list, and I know there are many familiar names and faces on there, so I'm glad to have this opportunity to meet and chat with you. Okay, um, if we can go to slide 19, Karen. I, I'm not driving this, guy, so. <laughs> um, so um, I have to issue the standard Federal Reserve disclaimer that I am speaking only for myself, not on behalf of the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve Banks, or their staff. Um, now if we could go to the next slide. Um, but having said that, let me give a shameless commercial here. Um, as many of you know, um, the Federal Reserve is one of the members of the Financial Literacy and Education Commission. And um, earlier this year, we just released an updated new national strategy for financial capability. And the new national strategy identifies four national goals um, in the financial capability arena. Um, one is an increased awareness of and access to effective financial education. And this is the let's get education in the schools goal, just to put it in plain language. Um, the other is to determine and integrate core financial competencies. And in fact, um, those have been identified as earning, spending, saving, borrowing, and protecting, so those five. Um, and, um, you know, we're hoping that more and more programs will come out sort of looking at what does it mean to be competent in earning, in spending, in saving, in borrowing, and protecting. And, um, and that hopefully if we can sort of get more materials and resources um, around, focused in on those core competencies, then that will aggregate up to a financially competent U.S. citizen. Um, the third goal is to improve the financial education infrastructure, and this really is some of what we're doing right here. It's building capacity among community educators, schoolroom educators, um, others to de develop and deliver rock-solid, good third-party unbiased research-based financial education and information. And then the fourth goal is to identify, enhance, and share effective practices. And this is what I will lovingly refer to as the research goal because you know I'm dealing with people through University of Wisconsin-Madison. We always need more research. Um, so, And I will share with you earlier today I was at a RAND behavioral finance conference and um, Every speaker said, and we need more research on um, how 
um, we can incorporate more behavioral concepts into personal finance. So, okay, with that shameless commercial out of the way, let's go to slide 21. And um, if you, I would encourage you all to read Pam's paper because um, she does a very, very interesting analysis on this, and she sort of hinted at all the control variables she threw into these regression equations. And what she what she comes away with is, number one, basic intelligence matters. And she showed you the difference that IQ score made in, um, in knowledge of sort of the personal financial assets you had. Um, number two, human capital matters. And as she mentioned that, you know, there was this difference between the college graduates and the non-college graduates. So education in general sort of matters. And then she was talking about how there's this very interesting very tenacious um, math skills piece that that lingers on from age 18 to age 66. So math in particular seems to matter in that human and capital development. And then um, something that she didn't talk about that I want to talk about a little bit, and that is she found that gender matters, um, that the men in the sample um, tended to be score higher than the women in the sample. And I want to talk about that in a little later. Okay, um, slide 22, please. So the other thing, of course, is there's a bunch of other things that also matter, and we know this from other research. And so I want to just put these out on the table as sort of part of that environment that we're talking about. So, for example, we know a lot that we know that experience matters. We have a number of studies that show that the more opportunities um, people have to acquire and manage money, the better they are at it. Um, so if you have a bank account, if you have a job in high school, you're going to be a better money manager. We know that income and household resources really, really matter. Um, the, the more income you have, the more choices you have in how you can manage and use your money. Um, and we have certainly learned in the last several years um, that Household resources in terms of the ability of additional earners to buffer the household against um, the shocks of unemployment really, really matter. Access to basic financial services really matters. Um, the convenience factor seems to matter. Barriers seem to matter. And motivation seems to matter. And the implication there, of course, is the more you can automate, the more um, uh, the easier it is to help people build um, assets. And um, again, I was at, a, um, um, at, the, at the behavioral finance class today. Um, there was a gentleman speaking about um, some banks are arranging with their consumers that once they finish paying off their car loan, there is a pre-commitment mechanism for continuing to take that $250 a month payment or whatever. And um, continue to, to, to put that then into a savings account. So you continue to make car payments to yourself. And so you are really continuing to pay yourself rather than pay the, the, the lender. Um, so any of that automation seems to be very, very helpful. Um, but basic access to financial services really comes before we even can talk about automation. Then finally, we know that attitudes and perception matter. Um, people's future-mindedness, whether or not you can think of yourself in four or five years from now, whether or not you can think of yourself when you are age 50 or 60 or 65, um, those are all very, and, and how you relate to that person, um, and it, it's all very, very much part and parcel of the kinds of financial behaviors that you exhibit where you are now. And um, people's tolerance for risk, um, it's more than just are you playing the lottery and buying those lottery tickets and Powerball tickets. It is, um, you know, what kind of investment risks are you willing to take? What kind of job risks are you willing to take to try to move up and into a higher-paying job or, or acquire some additional human capital skills that would enable you to earn more. Um, sometimes that can turn on you, and we have seen in recent years um, investments in education um, taking a little bit longer to pay back because it's very, very hard for new graduates to find jobs. So there's a, a risk issue right there. Okay, next slide, slide 23. 
Okay. So let's go back to the takeaways from um, Pam's study on basic intelligence, human capital, and gender. And, and, and what does that mean? So um, in terms of the basics that, you know, um, basic intelligence, IQ, cognition, matters. Well, you know, as, as Karen told you, I was a family and consumer science teacher in my, my, my first career. And so I have that general background, and I know enough to say, wow. So this, to me, says maternal nutrition is really important because without good maternal nutrition, um, you know, there is a, there's a definite impact on the IQ of that baby, and that may never be made up through all the other stimulation that you can, can take care of. So good maternal nutrition, good um, infant nutrition, good infant care, good parenting skills become very, very important. So if you're really thinking about this in the lives of consumers, it's not just all about money and economics and finance. It really is the whole cloth of um, raising you know, people who have not just financial security and economic security, but a whole set of other health security issues and nutrition security issues. So one of the big policy issues I look at then is, well, what are we doing in the WIC and SNAP programs? What are we doing in some of the Head Start programs? How can we continue those? Because those are foundational to people's financial management skills later on in life. Um, in terms of foundation and other general skills, um, I think it's real important, as much as I would love to see financial education in K-12 and actually K-16, um, I really do have to look at these data and say, you know what really matters are those, those basics of math, language arts, decision-making, critical thinking. In essence, it's the old teaching children to fish rather than giving them a fish. And so I think that, that those, those kinds of foundational skills are really very important. And as educators and community development people, we need to be sort of continuing to push our education systems to make sure that those foundational skills are there and, and that, that children have, have leave school, you know, sort of with the, the basic ability to read a simple contract and to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Um, and then to also ask that critical thinking question of what's in it for me? Is this good for me? Am I being sold something or am I actually seeking out a transaction or a, a, a choice? Um, okay, Karen, if we can go to the next slide, slide 24. So other implications for policy and practice really speak to the importance of lifelong learning. And Pam, I think, really set this up very well as she was talking about the difference between her grandmother and her mother and herself. Um, you know, we all know that we need information on an ongoing basis that is timely, that, that hits us when we need it, that is relevant to the kinds of decisions that we're making, and that is actionable, that I can actually do something with, that... Um, uh, uh, again, um, at this behavioral finance uh, workshop this morning, um, someone was talking about um, leakage out of 401k systems, and she was talking about how many people just simply cash out when they leave a job rather than rolling it over into 401k or leaving it with their employer. And she talked about why they didn't roll it over to a 401k. And she happened to be somebody who's on faculty at Harvard. And she went onto the Harvard website and she found out the form that she would need to um, take out her her um, her 401k money. And then if she wanted to roll it over, she had to roll it, get out another form, and and fill that one out. So here's two forms that she had to fill out. And remember, I was talking about barriers to actually implementing some of these things. So she said. You know, if I looked at these forms, I would probably throw up my hands and say, oh, for crying out loud, just send me the check. And so, you know, these have to be actionable, but they have to be easily actionable. I think we need to think about changes across the lifespan. And, you know, one of the things that Pam didn't get to, to talk about very much was, you know, not only how cognition plays a role 
across our working years, but how it continues to play a role on into retirement. And um, I read a very, very interesting article recently about how older consumers, and we are now talking about people over 65, are much more likely to use the decision um, tools like rules of thumb than to actually sort of sit down and think through and calculate out information because they don't rely on their ability. They're, they're concerned about their mental cognitive skills at 65, 75, 85, and so on. So how do we think about um, these changes over the lifespan, and then what roles are there for um, advisors and coaches? And how can we make sure that those advisors and coaches are trustworthy, capable, and um, giving that good third-party, unbiased, I don't have any skin in the game, or if I do have skin in the game, it's on your side kind of advice. Okay, if we can go on to the next slide, uh, slide 25. So what does it mean for future research? Um, I want to go back to that gender issue because I'm really intrigued with this. And partly it is because um, Pam found that gender mattered. And I just happened to be recently reading another um, research report that came out of the American Life Panel that also found that gender mattered in, in the same way. I mean, women were not as, as savvy as the men in this case. And so my wonderment is, what is it about gender that matters? Is this cohort specific? Is it these, these women who are, you know, 64, 65, 66, and that, in fact, they represent a particular um, age group and um, uh, uh, kind of lifestyle that we will age out of because women in my generation and your generation are more likely to have a stronger labor force attachment. We're more likely to have these 401ks. We're more likely to have to make allocation decisions among the, the, the 15 different investment options in my 401k so that, that the gender differences will go away over time. Or is there something much more fundamental? Is it math anxiety that women have? Um, one of the things that, that Pam talks about in her paper is she looks at the fact that um, among the people who answered these questions, they had an option to say, I don't know. They also had an option to refuse. And those of us who are researchers know that there are different characteristics associated with refusals versus don't knows. And, and the women were much more likely to be in, in the category of basically saying, um, you know, I, I, am, I don't know rather than I'm sort of refusing. Pam, correct me if I'm wrong on that. But it's, I found it fascinating that, that it, it, was, it was in that, that don't know refusal category that some of this stuff was being teased out. So what's really going on with gender there? And then finally, Pam um, talked about measures of financial capability. And I would challenge us both as practitioners, as policymakers, and as researchers to really think through what measures of financial capability we are using. Um, how do these vary by income? Do low-income families, modest resource families, um, are, are the are are they can they be financially capable without knowing about bond fund allocation? I, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, so I do not think that financial literacy measures are necessarily a one size fits all, and I think we have to be very thoughtful about those kinds of measures. Similarly, in urban and rural settings, what does it mean to be financially capable? In, in some of the rural communities in Wisconsin or anywhere in the U.S. versus in New York City or Chicago or Washington, D.C. So I think that there's some really, really interesting opportunities we have as researchers to tease out some of these distinctions and differences in the measures of financial capability that we use. So with that, I'm going to stop, and um, let's go on to answering some questions. Karen, I'll turn it back to you.
Great, and I just want to say a short thanks to, to you, Jean, and to you, Pam, for your presentations. Uh, we have lots of questions already in the queue, so certainly your presentations have struck a chord with folks. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, to try to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, when possible, I'll try to combine uh, questions that have similar themes, and we'll try to get through to as many as possible. So let me start with one theme that I, I'm seeing in the questions, and that was really about you know, what should the focus be in, in, in schools at early ages? There was a question that read, reads, well, financial education in the classroom, classroom is not as critical as basic math, reading comprehension, and decision-making. How critical is early banking? Should we be looking to bring accounts into the K-12 through classroom? And then a similar question is really just about, you know, if this is what he's hearing is that the smarter you are, the better you are with money. Is it your opinion that teachers should just focus on the three R's and not bother with financial education? So, so from either of you, Jean and Pam, should we be focusing on bringing accounts into the classroom? Should we be focusing on the the basics, reading, writing, arithmetic? What do you think? Well, I I, I think what my research says is that the general skills matter a lot. So I don't think that I can say that it wouldn't be important to include um, more kind of practical, bringing the accountant into the classroom. I can't say, based on these findings, that that wouldn't be important. What I can say is that it is very clear that these early kinds of skills that we learn in school matter a lot. And I want to emphasize, so Jean sort of alluded to this in her talk, and I want to emphasize this. What we understand about cognition, especially cognition once you've measured it when we did in the respondents in our study, so that they basically took these tests when they were approximately age 15. By that point, cognition strongly, strongly reflects the kind of schooling that you've had, the kind of parental environment that you've had, nutrition, a lot of the things that Jean was talking about. So the broader... Think about that cognitive measure as a cumulative measure of the kinds of experiences that children have had up until that point. So what I want to emphasize is not as much that the accountant might not matter, but that these broader general skills are clearly very important. And one of the reasons why I think that they might be important is in part reflects these differences between my mom and my grandmother. If my mom had taken a lot of very specific skill sets in high school, um, about how to manage money in high school, you know, it wouldn't be applicable for her today at age 65 like it was applicable maybe in 1957. Um, so that's part of the reason why the general skills might be important, to help people basically cope with a rapidly changing environment. And, and I would um, agree. I think, however, you know, when I talk talked about lifelong learning, I talked about, you know, education being timely, relevant, actionable, and ongoing. Um, I think that's still true even actually in the K-12 curriculum, that um, it has to be relevant, and I can see it, it would be very easy to keep on teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and, but make sure that there are some relevant personal finance examples in there. You know, when you're when you're doing the algebra and you're doing the, you know, learning how to take powers of things, that's compound interest. And it's compound interest whether you're talking about, you know, saving or whether you're talking about how much it's going to cost you on that credit card. So I think that, that you know, there are ways that we can roll personal finance into some of the, the, the core pieces. Um I, I need to, to just make sure I understand the question on the accounts. Is it should we bring back school banking? Yeah, let me let me get back to that question again. Uh, the idea was that you know if if financial education in the classroom is not as important as critical as basic math and reading and decision making practice, you know how critical is something like early banking? I guess something that gives you that opportunity to apply what you've learned. And should we be looking at to, looking into bringing accounts into the classroom, the K through twelve classroom? Yeah. So. This is my unbiased, unresearched, I mean, and I would, this would be a really great, a really great research project is to sort of look at like Mitchell Bank and to see if the kids that work, you know, if you could match them up with a similar high school that didn't have um, a high school bank and to look and see how those kids um, come out over time because 
I actually am a firm believer in school banking, and I know it is a loss leader for financial institutions, but I think, you know, if, if experience matters, let's give these kids some experience. Can't hurt, right? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Let me go to another question, and this is about uh, choices. Uh, Pam uh, out, uh, laid out for us kind of the choices that her grandmother made versus the kind of choices that her mother had to make and the choices that she needs to make. And in and, and that uh, last one of the last slides uh, Pam presented, just really a, a policy consideration that, that policymakers and practitioners consider the consequences of, uh, of associated with having a more choice for older Americans. So there's a question here that says, it seems like many voters, uh, like policymakers, who adopt policies that give us more choice, perhaps too many choices. How do we deal with this if voters themselves seem to like more choices, even if they don't have a full capacity to deal with all these choices? Well, it's actually sort of interesting. Um, for example, if you look at the Medicare prescription drug plan, which would be another example where, um, for those of you who are familiar with a, you know, maybe helped a, a grandparent or a parent try to navigate um, choices of different prescription drug plans, the reality is actually that people don't <laughs> oftentimes prefer to have lots of choices when it comes right down to it. Um, so the structure of that plan, for example, as much as people were excited to have prescription drug coverage, I think a lot of people feel like at the end of the day there's too many choices and they're overwhelming and they're not sure that they're making the right ones. Um, and I think, you know, Jean talked a little bit about this. Um, you know, the environment is, the policy context is, as it, you know, as it is. So it's how do we help people better cope with all of these choices? And I think Jean ha um, talked in a really nice way about how ways in which we can actually um, keep systems the way that, we, uh, that they are, but try to limit a little bit um, and make it a little bit easier for people. So to go back to the Medicare example, um, one of the things that they did in the early, most people know, right, you, you have your basic Medicare plan, but then you need supplemental Medicare health insurance because Medicare only covers about half of your overall health care costs. Um, so Medigap plans are the way a lot of people um, help fill in in terms of paying for the rest of those costs. And when those plans first started to emerge, it was a bit like the prescription drug thing where you had literally perhaps hundreds of different options. Um, but what the government did is step in and they, and they basically narrowed the choices down a little bit for people. And you have sort of, I think it's A through G. You have like seven or eight different options. There's standard options across those different plans. So people still have a fair amount of choices. It's not like they don't have any choice. But it's just, it's narrowed it down enough to make those choices sort of easier to navigate. Um, so I, I guess that's sort of the kind of policy implications from my perspective. Not that we just eliminate choices for people. You're right, I don't, I don't think that anyone wants no choices. But how do we simplify things a little bit to make it more feasible for people to actually navigate these complicated systems? Yes, yeah, some of you may know there's a wonderful article published a while ago um, where um, these market researchers went into these high-end grocery stores and they set up a table um, with jam, and they the first week they were there, they had like eight varieties of jam, and they would have people sample jam, and 45% of the people who stopped at the table to sample bought a bottle or a jar. Um, the next week they went in, and they had 26 varieties of jam, and um, of the people who stopped by to sample, 13% bought a piece, bought a jar of jam. So overchoice is clearly not the way to go. And I think, um, you know, the, the Medicare, Medigap um, analogy is really, really apt. Um, there's another researcher at William & Mary, a gal by the name of Julie Agnew, who did a study that basically showed that consumers sort of get into the too much information um, mode at about eight choices. So anything under eight is, is something that consumers can manage and deal with and, and select from. Anything nine or higher is clearly overchoice, and, and you actually end up not choosing rather than and walking away. You don't buy the jam, right? So it's, it's a really, really interesting kind of thing. And then thinking about how do you apply that in a policy mode to health care choices, to 401K choices, to... Um, you know, once many of us, once we start retiring, we're going to have to figure out how we 
spend down those 401k plans we've been building up. And, you know, what are our choices there? I don't even want to think about that. All right. Let's switch topics just a little bit. We've got a couple different questions about children and youth. And so the first question I want to ask you uh, both is about uh, the intergenerational effect. And, and Pam, there's a question to, to asking if it would be possible to assess the financial literacy of the children of the, of the Wisconsin group to see if there's an intergenerational effect on, those, on their children. Well, at the moment, we haven't started. We ask, um, we ask our participants in our study questions about their children, but as of yet, we haven't started interviewing uh, the children of these uh, graduates. Um, but we're actually looking to do that in the future. So that's one, th- one thing I'll definitely keep in mind and one thing I'd, I'd definitely be interested in, in asking these kids to get a sense about intergenerational effects of these things. What I can say, though, is that um, the the paper that I did here, or the research that I presented here, um, I was accounting for uh, parental educational attainment, parental income. Um, and interestingly enough, at least in this sample, I didn't really find, you know, parental ed- education, parental income would influence um, children's cognition. It influences their educational attainment. Um, but it didn't directly influence um, these financial literacy skills. It, its influence was confined to the ways that it affects people's educational attainment and their cognition and things like that. Okay, that's helpful, and we'll we'll look forward to more information in the future on that. Um, another question about youth, this one really about college-age students, and the question is, do either of you have any suggestions for teaching financial education to college-age students? Jean? <laughs> Um, well, certainly there are, um, you all probably know this better than, than I do, um, there are a lot of um, um, schools that have programs through their financial aid offices, through their colleges of human ecology or family and consumer sciences or however they're called. Um, if you have, um, are, are more interested in this, I would actually, I'm probably not the best person to be talking about this. Um, but I know Brenda Cood at the University of Georgia has been doing a one-semester, one-credit course for seniors who are about to launch. And sort of the, the top ten things you need to know when you get out there in the cold, cruel world. And um, I'm sure she would be glad to um, talk with any of you who are interested in that. And you can just find her on the um, uh, University of Georgia website. Great. That's a great resource. Thanks, Jean. Uh, I've got one question that's kind of a clarifying question for Pam. Uh, Pam, well, you talked about uh, the, the fact that the participants, uh, the way that you measured their, their knowledge was they had to be able to uh, articulate how much, you know, they had in their checking account and their private pensions and assets, that kind of thing. And the question was, do you know whether that knowledge is accurate? Um, there may have been some who were able to provide an, an answer but undoubtedly provided the wrong values. Absolutely. It's a great question. Um, so there's a few different ways we kind of tried to think about that. So one way we thought about this is that this is a sort of uh, a newer measure. I know of one or two other studies have done this, who have done this approach as well. Um, but there's a huge literature on how we measure financial literacy and what correlates um, with financial literacy skills. So one thing that I would say is that the variables that we looked at, things like, for example, gender, which Jean pointed out, um, our relationships, our other kinds of relationships that we look at looked really consistent um, compared to other measures of financial literacy. So that assured us to some degree. The other thing that we looked at was, so one, one person sort of made the argument to me that, and this is sort of a gender thing actually, that perhaps, for example, among men, um, perhaps they didn't want to say that they didn't know, you know, that, that it, would, it, would be, it would seem, a, you know, it would make them seem sort of um, not, not masculine enough or something if they, if they didn't know um, what their finances were. They didn't want to appear unknowledgeable. Um, so as it happens, we actually have this um, 
it's referred to as in, in sort of gender studies as a mas masculinity scale. It, it tells you kind of how much people adhere to traditional gender norms. And for men, this and there were questions actually that directly on that scale that directly allude to things like that, like you know people's level of discomfort with admitting that they don't know certain things. So we looked at that with the men to sort of see if that predicted a little bit people. Um, uh, differences between don't knows and refusals. And, and basically, we didn't really find any evidence um, of a relationship there. So that was one of the other ways that we, we tested it. We didn't find that people who felt, you know, uh, had, had very kind of strong, men who felt that they had v these very strong masculine traits were any more worried to say that they didn't know compared to other men. Um, but ultimately, the ideal way to test this is actually to match um, people's um, uh, answers to these questions with some direct administrative data. And we'll, we're actually going to be able to do a little bit of that with some of the measures um, in a few years. Um, so I'll be able to look at that a little more closely farther on. Great. And I think we have time for one last question. And this is a question that is um, about uh, home versus school, which has more effect. And so the question is, is, is a parental example or school experience more valuable? Should we focus on parental financial education? Um, well, I'll start, but I, I'm curious to see what Jean thinks about this. Um, I, you know, I think certainly what my findings illustrate, and from what I know of the the, the remainder or, or other research, I don't I don't think you can prioritize. I think these things are interactive. I think that they both matter a lot, actually. Um, so you want you want to effectively maximize both of those environments for um, kids to do well and ultimately do well across the, the rest of their lives. Um, I think I think the evidence is that both matter a lot, and it doesn't. If you really want to maximize outcomes, you you need to invest in both effectively. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I, it's actually a very interesting question, and I don't know if anybody is actually sort of done the empirical work on that to, to sort of make a definitive case. Um, it would be hard for me to argue one over the other. Okay. Great. So I just had a, a first of, again, I want to thank both Pam and Jean for this presentation. I, I think just by the level, uh, the number of, of people registered to participate in this webinar and the questions that, that we uh, received, they, they both uh, had dis had discussions and, and, and the, the topic was something that many people were very interested in. So thank you again for for sharing uh, your, your presentations with us. Um, again, just as a reminder, if there are, uh, if you want to share this information with your colleagues, uh, tomorrow we will have this uh, webinar archived and posted on the Center for Financial Security's website. So you, you can and go there to access the webinar as well as to access uh, Pam's full paper. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention that uh, we have w another webinar scheduled next month, um, Tuesday, June 28th. The topic for that webinar is Technology as a Teaching Tool for Low-Income Populations. Wendy Way from the, United, uh, from the University of Wisconsin at Madison is going to be the presenter, and she's going to share her research. And then we have two discussants, which will kind of give us the practitioner perspective. Uh, Nick Maynard from D2D and Bruce Bates from the FINRA Foundation will both serve as discussants. So uh, stay tuned for more information about that upcoming webinar. Thank you.